Well, thank you, Karsten, for your kind introduction. And it's a big, big, big honor to be here. And uh, I'd like to also thank uh, President uh, Anders Bjarklev for his uh, kind words. It's, we are in the same club, as he mentioned, the UTEC. And, and it's a very good opportunity to visit our sister school here, the DTU, which is, of course, very famous. And it's not the first time I'm here. I was on the on the committee of uh, one of your programs uh, uh, case. And uh, so, uh, so we had very fruitful interactions in the past. And so today, it's a big honor to give the uh, Ørsted lecture. Ørsted is a giant in science. And so it's always a big challenge for somebody to give a named lecture with such a heavyweight name. And as you see, I was uh, trying to uh, uh, to uh, give credit for some of the major, I think this list could be very, very long. And so, uh, so Professor Ørsted is the founder of DTU, and of course he has, to his credit, that he discovered the magnetism generated by electric currents. But he also was uh, the one that discovered or isolated aluminum. And then he studied philosophy, I, I read. He was one of the Kant <laughs> experts. So you can see in those days that people had very general knowledge in science, and it was not only that science, it was a general culture that was uh, prevailing. And I hope that some of this is transpiring in today's uh, philosophy. So, so the lecture today is uh, on a uh, on mesoscopic system. I just want to give you avant goût, a flavor of what I was going to hear about. So first, uh, I will talk to you a little bit about these uh, Mesoscopic. Mesoscopic means the size domain is between uh, uh, 2 and 50 nanometer. So these speeds are bigger, but they have a pore size in the 2 to 50 nanometer range. And I should mention to you that the, these are very exciting new uh, kind of uh, structures. They, uh, they will, uh, for example, absorb a dye like this green dye and turn all green, huge internal surface area. And so the internal surface will be coated with this dye structure. We have the attaching carboxylate groups here. And then when light strikes the speeds, a surge of electric power will come out. So that within the absorption range of this sensitizer, every incident photon is converted to electric current. So it's just amazing how a disorder structure can deliver such high electric current and such high conversion efficiencies. We'll see later. So that's going to be one of the themes. And we are also very excited about these uh, perovskites. Uh, this is a methyl ammonium lead iodide. These are perovskite structures which have a very high uh, cross section for light absorption. So, so we can go down in uh, the thickness of the uh, absorber layer to less than one micron and still harvest uh, all the incoming photons below 800 nanometers. It's, and so what that means is you get, you get very high counts, but not only that, you get high voltages delivered from a simple system like this. And so this has now been a, it's a very hot topic, and papers appearing in science and nature all the time. So I'd like to give you a flavor of where we stand with that investigation. But then uh, I also notice you have a lot of uh, common uh, interests. Uh, it's been a passion of mine for us. All my career, I actually started in the field of fuel generation from sunlight. And I'm one of the last Mohicans left that, <laughs> together with Nate Lewis, who was an uh, Earthlet lecturer I heard three years ago. And so, uh, so, I'm, uh, so, so we have been very active in the fuel generation, direct fuel generation from solar radiation. And I'll tell you a little bit. If, time permits it at the end of my presentation. And so the outline, then I just say a few remarks, some general remarks, and crystalline junctions, and some work on how to tailor sensitizers. What are the guiding concepts to make a, a, a light absorber? We know the chlorophyll structure is that something we can learn from, is that uh, can this inspire us to make very efficient sensitizers. And so I'll tell you a little bit about this. And then I mentioned the solid state cells, quantum dots. These are the lead iodide quantum dots. 
some commercial applications and time permitting, I'll say a few words at the end about the photosystems for the fuel generation from solar radiation. And so, but you know the problematic, as we said, we said in Lausanne, <laughs> increasing world population, increasing world energy demand has been doubling, it's gonna double in the next 20 years. So how to cover all of this? And so we have, of course, on top of this pollution problem, we have, you might say, well, let's use all the coal and so on, but it's, that's very limited. And uh, pollution comes in, global warming comes in. So the, the oil peak is, uh, has happened, according to some analysts. So in some countries, definitely. I was in, in Oman at the beginning of this year, and they don't have, they have spent all their oil. I think the North Sea oil also, the, the days are counted. So, and then we have the nuclear risk. So Switzerland is phasing out nuclear reactors by 2030. And so our government is scratching their heads how to <laughs> recover this one third of the electricity of the country is produced by nuclear power. And so we have to definitely make a step towards renewables. And so the, the uh, renewables, <laughs> Of course, we have, there's the solar electricity and PN junction, the classical concepts. This is a, a simple scheme of the disensitized cell. I'll talk about this later. Then we have the, the solar fuels, uh, which I'll be mentioning at the end of my talk. But there's also a lot of work done in uh, artificial photosynthesis. So fortunately, I have to say, uh, the, uh, uh, the uh, Obama government has given a lot of money to American institutions. There are about 50 institutions or 50 centers that uh, have been funded generously to address some of the questions associated with how to mimic uh, photosynthesis. In other words, how to sunlight to produce fuels directly without going through the electricity generation. And we also have, we shouldn't forget, solar thermal and uh, so that's going to be, I'm going to be mainly focusing on these two areas. And so, well, you know what a solar cooker is. That's solar thermal. And this is a classical silicon solar cell farm. Here are some desensitized mod modules. They have been now running for several years in, in uh, Jerusalem. That's hot climate, uh, intense solar radiation. And no signs of any decay or decrease in performance so far, these panels that produced by 3G Solar, a company in Jerusalem. Same thing here, the outdoor testing. So that, that, that's the, the status of the technology we have uh, with regards to the disensitized cells is that the uh, industry has been picking up from the laboratory. It's not anymore a laboratory tech technology. It's, of course, the laboratory is extremely important to, to uh, bring new systems in the pipeline for industry. But industry has picked it up, and, uh, and so the first buildings are being uh, equipped with the, uh, these transparent glass modules that you can make out of the disensitized cells to provide facades that will uh, produce electric power from, from sunlight, from daylight. And so the, uh, this is the uh, paper we published 20 years ago, and. Uh, it's been, uh, it's, it's been the, first, the first to report on the three-dimensional structure. Uh, before that uh, publication, everybody used a single crystal flat junction. Uh, and so there was actually uh, the, the prevailing opinion that you would waste your time trying to, to, to test disorder structures of this uh, kind simply because the, if, if you do ge generate electric charges, like the plant does in photosynthesis, in a way, um, they would recombine much more quickly than you'd be able to collect so many defects. And, and so, uh, but we were, in a way, naive with uh, Brian or Regan. We, we thought, well, uh, we had done some work before on colloids. And, and so as a chemist, we <laughs> didn't have all this uh, uh, bias towards uh, uh, or against those, uh, those nanostructured systems. And so the, 
the system is then uh, composed of a film that is uh, just a, uh, uh, consisting of, uh, of nano particles or mesoscopic particles. It's a, it's a material that is uh, commonly used in toothpaste, TiO2. It's just a small size. And so when you put those particles in a film, you generate a high surface area film. And so the dye can absorb by self-assembly on the surface and just coat with a molecular film those particles. That's very easy to do. You just dip your film uh, in a dye solution, pull it out. You have the self-assembled monolayer on the surface. And so that's depicted here. These stars are the dye monolayer. And then uh, when you excite the dye by, by, by sunlight or any solar, any visible light, the synthesizer will then inject a charge, an electron in the particle here, or a, a positive charge in the electrolyte. So it generates charges much in the same way as chlorophyll does in photosynthesis. When chlorophyll gets excited in the green leaf, it first generates electric charges, which then are consumed very quickly in electrochemical reactions to make fuels. So here we have, uh, we collect the charges, and uh, you see there an example for a cell uh, below. It shows you the transparency. It shows you the fan is turning. So these classes are, are unique in, in, in a way because there's no other technology that can provide a cell that has this spatial capture. It's bifacial, bifacial cell captures light from the front and the back and converts very efficiently to, to electric uh, power. So over a long time, we had those this classical components, the sensitizing dye like this ruthenium complex. Note these carboxylase groups that are there to attach the dye. The nanoparticulate film, and this is an ionic liquid, which uh, is a very, very important component in uh, today's commercial devices. They all use ionic liquids. Why? Well, they, they have a very low vapor pressure. They don't. It can be solidified easily, and so, and so those ionic liquids, just from a practical point of view, they're preferred over solvents-containing systems that would evaporate or leak out of the device. And so when we excite, as I said, the sensitizer, it does ejects an electron, and we have to uh, regenerate the dye with this uh, material that carries the positive charge, or elect electron donor system. It's called the redox couple. And so now we have electrons and the oxide and positive charges. It's in the electrolyte or some other solid that will serve to move the positive charges. Charge separation across the interface. That's the key word. It's not that the charges are created in the same material, like you excite a silicon photovoltaic cell. Well, the electron as a whole is is created in the same material. They will recombine very quickly, within microseconds in a silicon solar cell. Within microseconds, the charges recombine. And so, so you need to have very pure material to be able to capture those charges before they recombine. You need 99.99999, there's six nines in the figure, okay? So that's not cheap. Nobody can tell me that you can make this kind of fuel or silicon material at low price and low energy expenditure. And so here we separate the charge across an interface, and that makes the, it gives you an advantage. The, the lifetime of those uh, carriers, the electron positive pair, is, uh, can be much longer than microsecond. It can be seconds, as a matter of fact, because the recombination has to happen across the interface. And so by, by engineering the interface uh, uh, traditionally, you can uh, stop or retard the recombination. So that sets up a voltage, and then you can drive cards with the device. That's all that's through it, and it's uh, very close to the green leaf. And so here's, uh, here's just one embodiment. With the, I'll show you now a real system with this ruthenium complex being attached by coordinative binding to the surface titanium ion. So that's how the dye hooks on the surface. And being excited, it injects. And the iodide is used as a donor to regenerate the dye, forming triiodide, which is the oxidized form of iodide. 
And so that's then going to the counter electrode. And, uh, and it's re back reduced by the electrons. So it's a cyclic process that happens in that cell. There's no net chemistry. There are also several embodiments now. We have a whole family growing rapidly. So, so this is the classical one I just explained to you. This is the current so, uh, top efficiency is close to 13%. But the uh, solid hole conductor cells are catching up. So these are now materials where the positive charge is transported by hopping. It's not anymore moving in an electrolyte. There's no more liquid. It's amorphous solid, organic solid, or inorganic solid, p-type conductor that moves the hole to the back contact. So what, is then the, what are the virtues of the nanostructure at oxide? Well, first of all, the high internal surface area enables efficient light harvesting. That's fine. Per se, this high surface area is not desirable. I should emphasize that. Because the more surface area, the more the <coughs> back the reaction occurs. So actually, you want to cut the surface area to, 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 down to the minimum. But for a normal dye that has typically extinction coefficient, you know, in chemistry between 10, say, 10 and, and 50,000 uh, per mole centimeter, we need to have a 1,000 times enhancement of surface area to collect the incoming sunlight. That's, that's the advantage of this nanocrystalline film. It provides this high surface area. You will see that with the new absorber materials, the trend in this research and technology goes towards a more powerful uh, absorber materials. Uh, like the, I mentioned the, lead, the ammonium lead iodide perovskite particles. They have about 10 times higher absorption power than a dye. So you can go down to one, below one micron in the film thickness. You don't need, here the, to get to this 1,000 times surface in, uh, uh, in enhancement, you need about 10 micron thick film of these nanoparticles. So you can go down to much thinner films today with new absorber materials, including new dyes, including pigment particles that uh, are powerful in harvesting sunlight. And so, uh, so here's some other advantages. The small size avoids space charge inhibition. So these films are, these films are insulating. They're white. They have, uh, they have no electric conduction in the dark state. But when light hits the dye, it injects an electron or electrons in the particle. So the particle switches from a dark state where it's insulating to a conducting state. It takes only one electron in one particle to do that switch. Okay? So that's, uh, that's very, very important. Because if, if you needed to dope the particles to make them conducting, you would have a problem. There's some interference of the, 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 dope, the, uh, the dopant and the electrons you create by the dopants. So you don't want that. But the screening is important. If you inject a charge in a nanoparticle, you want, you want more than one charge. Typically, we have 20 electrons per particle. Well, they would, there would be repulsion. There would be some kind of Coulomb blockade or space charge limitation. But that's not happening here. It doesn't happen. It's amazing. <laughs> Why? Well, on the surface, there are ions that screen those electric charges and allow the percolation to happen without impediment across these nanoparticular films. And so that's shown here. So we can move electrons in and out. If you create them in biosensitizer, you can collect them. You can also inject them. You can run the cell as an electroluminescent device or as a battery. So that's the trick. No space charge limitation. A photocon. And you can go further. You can uh, now draw an electric equivalent circuit. I won't go into details. Our colleague, Juan Bispert from, uh, uh, from Spain, he has uh, been uh, our master. He has taught us how to do that. And we are using impedance spectroscopy intensively to, to evaluate what the resistance for moving electrons through those particles is, and the transport resistance, and the recombination resistance. What's the resistance for the electrons returning to the electrolyte through a recombination process? And so, uh, 
So this is the only equation I will show you. Don't, don't, be, don't be scared. So the continuity equation is actually simple. You have, a, a, you have a, this term, which is the rate of change in number of conduction when electron. Well, on steady state, when the cell is operating, that rate of, is, is zero. You have just a zero. You have a certain population of charges that is stationary in those particles, like 20 electrons per particle. And so that becomes zero, and then you have absorption term, and you have diffusion term and recombination term. And actually, you can solve this differential equation if your recombination term is linear in concentration of electrons. Like here, I showed it be linear in concentration. And then you can model, you can do the equivalent uh, uh, circuit modeling and get actually the rate parameters out of the uh, impedance measurements. And so at the end, what matters is can you collect the carriers which you generated by light? And so very, very simple uh, competition kinetics. What matters is the transport time and the recombination time. Just retain those two things. How fast can the electrons be collected? You make them in this 10 micron thick film. How fast can I take them out? And so the answer is takes a few milliseconds. Depends on how many electrons we have. And so, but just take a few milliseconds as a typical figure. So that means that the recombination time, you have to be in the 100 millisecond range. Otherwise, you're not collecting. So we need to be 100 milliseconds in recombination. Otherwise, the electrons will recombine before we collect them. It's very simple. And, uh, and that's happening. I'll show you one example later. You can actually show that this is happening. So how did all of this evolve? Well, at the beginning, this was our first paper. It actually dates to the received 84. Wow, almost 30 years ago. Well, I'm sorry to say, but that's how fundamental research goes, OK? I mean, it's a curiosity-driven work. And you, you were fiddling around with our laser. We, had, we were the first to make colloidal uh, semiconductor particles. They are called quantum dots today. We call them colloids. You see here colloidal anatase particles, OK? So uh, now some people even call them colloidal quantum dots, <laughs> which is, of course, nonsense, OK? <laughs> so, uh, so anyway, small particles, OK? A few uh, 20, 30 nanometer. We made them in solution. They gave a transparent solution, OK? You don't see them. They're going to scatter light. That was marvelous. I was really intrigued by that, by the first observation of this type. And so when we made those particles in solution, then we said, oh, well, it's transparent. We can put a laser beam across and see. We generate carriers and see how these carriers kinetically behave. So it was curiosity-driven and nothing else. But we found something. We found that the uh, injection, when we used the sensitizer, highly efficient sensitization. We found that when we used the sensitizer, we could inject much faster than the electron would come back out of the particle. Wow. So, well, maybe we can collect. If it's, if it's like this, maybe we have to, enough time to collect the curves as electric current and make a photovoltaic device. But it was all fundamentally driven. It was mission-oriented in a way. We had the solar, we always had solar fuel generation in mind at the beginning. It was only in the dire days in 2004 when the oil went to $4 a barrel. There was no more support <laughs> for this research. I tell you that. And so that I said, well, we better turn to something we can sell, maybe, <laughs> to, the, uh, to, the, to the public, something that is useful, like PV cells. And, and, uh, and so that's uh, when we became interested in the photovoltaics. And, but we never turned away from this research. We always continued. And so we made the first uh, uh, cell, which looked at and uh, more sophisticated in nature. Scale up, you have seen that today as we have mass production in, uh, in Wales. Uh, the, uh, the production is now, uh, the rate of production is 250 kilometers a month. That's um, one line of these uh, photovoltaic flex cells in a whole to roll. And uh, 
well, we'll show you later some applications. Here is one of them, these bags. And there are other interesting products. And now products being sold that use these cells. And so the yearly output is a few megawatts. If you count 250 kilometers a month, it's it's 3,000 kilometer of this tape per year. 3,000 kilometers, okay. And that you cut in small pieces and, uh, and use like uh, on a bag like this. And so, uh, but there's another branch that developed in the practical sense is our building integrated for the world tax. And so here's a, I don't want to go through all the details. Uh, you can read it, but this, uh, outdoor performance, the, the module efficiency now 9.9, .9, this is certified. And uh, we have an advantage in indoor, I'll show you that later, stability. Energy payback time is very short. And uh, I should mention to you that the, the plant in Cardiff uses a windmill to provide power for the production. And, and so that uh, puts down the carbon footprint to below six grams per kilowatt hour, which is very, very low. 10 times less than a silicon cell. And so uh, let's now quickly go about some of the research. And so a lot of people interested in moving the spectral response to about 900 nanometer. That's the optimum threshold for a single junction photovoltaic device. And so, uh, so we have that trend. And uh, so the chemists tailoring dyes, and you see it, there has been success. I mean, this blue dye gives 27 milliamps. It picks up at 1,000 nanometers. And so that has been uh, uh, one branch of the ruthenium complexes, still ongoing. Ruthenium complexes are used commercially. In all the devices that uh, you see, the ruthenium complex are used because they, they have gone through all the stability screening. And so, but there is an issue with the redox mediator being uh, much too far away from the HOMA level of most of these dyes. Most of these dyes have a redox potential of one volt, and so the iodide is at uh, 0.4, and you see 600 millivolts go down the drain in this react. That's not really nice, that's not good. So we have to cut, try to, to decrease that. And so new, new chromophores came in, and so these are so-called donor acceptor donor moiety bridge acceptor. And that's another one where the bridge is a chromophore. So that has put a tremendous uh, excitement in the field, energy. A lot of people working on these new sensitizers. And so the outcome of this has been that uh, we, needed, uh, we needed some support from the theoretical groups. And, and so it's now a key. If, if you don't have support of theoretical groups, you'll not make it, okay? It's as simple as that. You better have two or three sort of theoretic groups supporting you because the tasks are tremendous. And so you want to calculate the spectra. You want to change the donor, the bridge, or the acceptor, and you want to know what's going to happen to my absorption spectrum, the properties of the molecule. This you can calculate today. The methods exist. The, with the DFT calculation, there are now functionals that are fairly reliable. With, with, with 0.1 EV precision, you can predict the absorption maximum of some of these dyes. And so we have been, uh, we have also be interested in, in doing calculations on how the dye attaches. So all of this is uh, very, very necessary to do the fundamental investigations on the interface characteristics. And then under shock, he found that if a new reading, this mediator, which didn't seem to work with a ruthenium complex. We tried for about 10 years. Can you imagine? 10 years of frustration. So all of a sudden, these do DPIA, these donor acceptors, they seem to work. <laughs> so, so, uh, so then, of course, people, we picked it up and we found, yes, you use a new dye and almost 10% efficiency. That was amazing with a simple dye like this. And... Uh, and so the efficiency climbing with porphyrin dyes now being turned into donor accept dyes. And so we got a new upturn in our efficiency curve. That is uh, very, very encouraging. And so the, you can see here the porphyrin sensitizer, which co-sensitized so that 
you don't get a green. The green die would look would have a dip here. This die is green. Uh, if you want it green, it will be a little bit less efficient. Okay. Some people like to have a green glass, and so uh, but not much. It's a small difference. But if you want a full spectral response, we will use a mixture of these two. You can see over 80% of incident photons converted to electric current. And not only that, it's, uh, it comes at a high voltage. So the voltage being 940 millivolts. Okay. Aswani, Aswani was the lead author of this paper in science that we published last year. And so, uh, so this really shows the power of the the technique, you change, you adapt the energy levels of the redox coupled to the dye, and all of a sudden, you get a much higher voltage out. So it's, a, it's a very nice rational approach that paid off. Of course, there had to be a breakthrough, and the breakthrough was actually under Schockfeld's work, who came up with that idea to use a, the matching. The dye has to match the redox couple. And so he, he had this in his mind, and it was a successful thought. It tells you also that this is not only on our shoulders, that the whole is, the domain is, is uh, supported by a huge activity. We have, uh, last year we had about 5,000 papers published and, and 500 patents in one year. So, so we, are, we are a small <laughs> entity in this whole thing. And so uh, tonight, I fly to Taipei. It's a very big meeting, and, and especially in, I, in, in Asia, it's a very, very active area. So, so we're also doing modeling. I don't want to too much. We, we, are, we have quantum mechanical. This is the M06, uh, M or M06 uh, functions that fit those porphyrins very well. So we're very happy with that. But we have Pro Professor Rotlisberger, our our colleague is doing with her students the calculation. And so what, what we can see here, we're moving down with the, the sense size level that has been steady, but we have, we have much less loss. See, this distance was the loss we had originally, now we're bringing this down. And so more work has been published in Nature Communications, getting new record VOCs over one volt now. And there's also, I should say, the new redox couples that come up, like this uh, hydroquinone quinone. That's a biological system. Why didn't people think about this before? Well, I thought about it, and I thought it wouldn't work. <laughs> so, well, I tried it, actually. I tried it once. And, uh, and it's, uh, the issue was that of the proton, proton balance is a proton coupled electron transfer. So very easy to to solve that by just using a base, so you make the diionine. You see, somebody comes up with a simple idea, and all of a sudden things fall in place. And uh, this is like Li Chen Sung, he's from, uh, from Stockholm, from KTH. So they get also very good results. I mean, 17 milliamps, 750 millivolts. Amazing. And also here, some work in Japan, where actually now the transport goes by electronic hopping. It's not that the molecule has to move anymore. It's just uh, like the code who's a band bond exchange, a hopping mechanism. So also very good results with this. So the field is thriving. And last, I just want to mention to you the, uh, the solid state. So when uh, recently this, this methyl ammonium iodide says, uh, has been uh, uh, the the, the has been a very exciting discovery, and and uh, they uh, the efficiency is now exceeding over nine percent. So now we're replacing that molecular dye with the uh, with these uh, perovskite nanoparticles. The band gap is 1.5. Here's the band alignments. It's very nice. Very little loss in the charge separation step, and and the main thing is they are very powerful light absorbers. Uh, this uh, this is shows an electron microcarb of the nanoparticles on TI2. You see these little bumps here. These are the perovskite nanoparticles. And uh, here you see how black this turns. It's just a thin film, one micron, less than one micron. It's suffice to, uh, to uh, capture the charge and over 10% conversion efficiency. And so let's look at the applications. This is uh, one of the... Uh, 
So only cells, you can, we can, we, this is printed, the cell is printed, so you can print uh, uh, motifs that are pleasant uh, from the aesthetic point of view. And, and this is a solar cell, you wouldn't think uh, that, you know, when you look at it. So, so here's uh, the module. This is actually in Denmark here. It's uh, from, a, from a Danish architect, a lady that works in, uh, in, uh, in Aarhus. Uh, so she, you can see actually her picture, she took the shot, but you can see her here as a reflection of, so I can't recognize who, exactly who that is. But it's here in Copenhagen, okay? You will recognize you better than I that this is the city here. So also on steel, we have uh, production there in Wales, it's the outdoor measurements, showing that actually the, there is an advantage in outdoor conditions over standard. The standard measurement is the so-called AM 1.5, done at 25 degrees for sunlight. You have to cool the cell to get that condition. Outdoor, we have an advantage. Cloudy skies or getting warmer. Silicon underperforms, the dark cell. This is over 40% overperformance. That outperforms over standard, what you would expect from your, from your certification. And so more of this. Uh, Sony now showing that uh, actually a 14% silicon cell produces as much electricity as a 10%. That's energy uh, as a 10% Dyson's test over a year. So there is a significant outdoor advantage. And this is now the long-term testing. We have the 85-85 test passes, 8% module. That's 85 centigrade, 85 humidity. One sun irradiation, heat cycle. These are the three harsh conditions you have to apply to your cells before they can be sold for, for outdoor use. That's what the standard calls. But we, and what, we, the, the tolerance 5%. If you lose more than 5%, that's it, you don't pass. And not only on one test, you have to go through all three tests, and at the end, it should be within 5% of your initial. But that is pretty tough. But you can do it with the new solid state ionic liquid electrolytes and this ruthenium dye is no problem. Also long term tests. You see some modules that come out of Fraunhofer. This uh, in Frankfurt we had the PV sec 2012. And they had this uh, very nice. This is a photovoltaic cell, a wall that produces electric power. And uh, Dr. Hinch, uh, the person you saw before, this is actually the inventor, Dr. Hinch from, from the Fraunhofer in Freiburg. And uh, they uh, auf dem Weg in die Fassade. So they, you know, they want to make the Fassade. And believe me or not, I found them a client immediately. I mean, the people just love it. Architects love it. And so, uh, so now they have to deliver. They have to <laughs> go up in production, invest. And, it's a different story. Once you say A, you have to say B, okay? You can't just show it, say, I'm going to the make facade modules, and then you want the back pedal, oh, then now, but they won't. They, they're excited about it. So, so uh, it's another way of having modules <coughs> in Korean. This is a project in Lausanne. Professor Rondix got the contract for the outdoor wall of a uh, of our new Conquest Center at, uh, at, the, at EPFL. And I'm sure that when next time when President Barclay will visit, maybe we can show him this <laughs> building. <laughs> and so uh, you can walk. <laughs> this is how the, the, uh, the system will, will look. And you see here the, the School of Aarhus has been particularly uh, supportive. They have done many years of study with students showing that this technology is actually the only one that is adapted to deliver on these transparent facade modules that produce electricity from sunlight. And so in also in Japan, now uh, some commercial applications starting with transparent cells. This is indoor, we see the, uh, now another strength as I said is you know, the indoor applications and uh, so we have the, uh, we have a comparison by Texas Instruments, also that was presented at PVSEC the, the last year. You see the uh, 
performance at 400 lux, that's a window sill kind of situation. The die cells, two die cells here. This is OPV and I'm more silicon. Well, clearly they, they outperform by a factor of three. Even these are not a commercial, these are the flexible cells. And uh, we did some lab tests with this Osram uh, 230 light source. We got 26% conversion efficiency. If we run against silicon under the same conditions, silicon gets only 9%. So we are three times better. We don't have to be ashamed. There are some conditions, indoor ambient, where we're better than the best today's solar technology. And that's also the uh, opinion of Sony. Sony makes those charger lights, uh, so-called Hana Akari, that charge a battery during the day. You never take those cells out in the sun. That's not the idea to hold the lamp in the sun for three hours and then bring it in, have it, the light at night. No captures the ambient and recycles ambient light, puts it in a battery, and in the evening, the LED, LED will bring the light back. And so uh, I mentioned the plant with the windmill in, uh, in Cardiff. I, sh I showed you that. These are some products, the, the computer uh, keyboards. I just wanted to tell you that uh, at the time when uh, the German president was visiting, there were some tax issues between the two countries. Okay? And so, uh, so at first, they, they, the German president had a rather grim expression on his face, but look how he smiles after we, this is the Swiss president, uh, Doris Deutscher. After that present came, it was a real, <laughs> uh, a, a, a real, uh, relaxing for the atmosphere and everything worked out fine. So indoor applications, India, bags, bringing light again. The tsunami victims, again, these are indoor powered lights. You just look at this couple, how happy they are, just <laughs> with a lamp. And I was so happy, I got one of those lights from the uh, Japanese colleagues and I put I just put it in my office in case we get a tsunami in Switzerland or earthquakes. I need it. <laughs> so that, and so the, these are rooftop applications. This is, a, this is the uh, new keyboard. This is a, a Logitech product. The product sells currently at about 10,000 to 20,000 sales per week. It's a money-making photovoltaic device. Think about it. So, so this is what you need. You need photovoltaic technology that can bring in a profit to the company that uh, produces it. And actually, I wanted to sh Well, I, yeah. I have one of those flex cells with me, so if you want to have a look at it. This is the market picture. So the market is growing, and uh, just look at scale. This one billion dollar scale on the left side. Now I should mention this application here. You have to uh, educate the youngsters, and because the the, the, the uh, challenge is, of course, to get good people, excellent, best in this field, motivate them. So we have this uh, blackberries. We can make those uh, cells out of the blackberry dye. It's an anthocyanin, and uh, it goes on to the CI2 film spontaneously, and it makes it those dark cells here. Yeah. And so I, this is a quantum mechanic calculation of what's happening. But let's just go on. It's a younger generation, and I should point this is Torben Lund. He, just look at what the mama says here. This is, I don't know whether to Torben translated it to me that, like the mother was unhappy about the <laughs> Michael. I don't know who, who, so who that should be to, to, to fool around with the blackberry. So, uh, so this, uh, actually, I should tell you, uh, the time is up, so. I'll, uh, I have to stop here. Uh, it's very, uh, there's a little section that uh, goes on the hydrogen generation. I think I'm
pretty much out of time. i just show you one slide, that perhaps to show you the, our hydrogen system, which we won't have the time to go in interest of uh, discussion. I just have to, uh, I want to show you this copper oxide photoelectrode, photocathode, which we developed. It has a protective layer which prevents corrosion. And we have, uh, so we have a, a PN junction. P is copper oxide, N is zinc oxide. It pulls out the carriers before they corrode the copper oxide. It's, it's a little trick. It helps also to prevent recombination. And that gray part is a titanium oxide overlayer. And so, uh, so this can be scaled up easily. And uh, this is now amazing. This is now much a, a bigger surface area. We have, we have, this is like 30 square centimeter. We just printed. It's simple, cobalt oxide, cheap, simple water splitting, just by putting that ALD overlayer, by blocking overlayer to prevent a photocorrosion reaction. And so, uh, so here's the hydrogen coming off. Here's the oxygen coming off. I should uh, uh, mention to you that, uh, of course, that would be a talk on its own, but uh, uh, I have to stop here. So uh, this is uh, the end of my lecture. I will give credits now to uh, my co-workers. And uh, so I have a whole number of co-workers that uh, are on this project. As you can see, we have funding. And uh, this is the EPFL. I think Anders will remember from his visit the Lake Lac Léman. And uh, that's it. Thank you. <laughs>